Hello, baseball and umpire fans, and welcome to The Leading Edge, where we talk with umpires about umpiring and look to cover topics on both sides of the plate. Joining us here in this episode is a man that has been to a few national championships, has umpired in nine of ten provinces, and has even been slammed through a table a time or two, Trevor Stoiko. Topics we cover are him winning a few provincial championships as a player, working baseball in his hometown of Melville, Saskatchewan, and across the prairie lands, and his professional wrestling career. So sit back, relax, get ready. It's coming. Interesting baseball facts. When former New York Giants and Green Bay Packers tackle Cal Hubbard was done playing football, he turned to baseball, but this time as an official, not a player. Hubbard was an umpire for the American League between 1936 and 1951. In that span, working four World Series and three All-Star games. After being forced to retire due to a hunting accident that damaged the vision in his right eye, Hubbard became supervisor of umpires for the American League finally retiring in 1969. Hubbard came up with the idea that umpires needed to be positioned better on the field in order to make the most consistent calls. So, based on his suggestion, Major League Baseball implemented the four umpire crew. That system is still in use today. Interestingly enough, Hubbard is the only man in history to be elected to both the Baseball and the Football Hall of Fame. And with that little piece of knowledge for your brain sack, we would like to welcome you to this episode of The Leading Edge, where we talk with umpires about umpiring and look to cover topics on both sides of the plate. Now, like we typically do before we get on to this week's episode, we'd like to do a recap of the last episode where we brought on former Prince Edward Island baseball umpire provincial supervisor and current author in the making, Kent Walker. Now, if you were able to catch that show, here's a quick recap of what you heard. And if you missed it, well, I guess this is what you missed. Oh, I played. I played since I was 10. Didn't start umpire until I was done playing, pretty much. The, the fascinating thing to me about uh, major screw-ups is it requires a perfect storm. It's not just one mistake that leads to a, a, a fatal error by an umpire. It takes three or four different things. It, a lot of people start out at the Pee Wees, and they loved coming to PEI because they, they take their golf clubs and spend an extra week here or whatever, and everybody looked forward to it. After 95, where I learned so much at the Pee Wee in Summerside, the very next year I got to go to the Pee Wee in Summerside. So I phoned Air Canada and couldn't get a ticket. So I'm thinking, great, my first trip away and I'm not going to be there because I couldn't get a trip for two days. It would have been Friday afternoon before I got there. I phoned Baseball Canada back and they got me, somehow they got me a plane ticket and I was there on time. I don't know how they did it because I couldn't get it through Baseball Canada, through Air Canada. Yeah, Andre, Andre Lachance, of course, was the, the guy. The guy is a magician. I've been to a lot of national tournaments, either the supervisor or an umpire, and there are a lot of really good umpires and a lot of really great characters. I mean that in the best way possible. He's also one of the best supervisors I've ever had, Dave Cass, and definitely the most prepared. Uh, fortunately, we had a Canadian supervisor, Howard Chapman, learned a lot from Howard. So the throw is coming from right field to third base. It's going to be close. And this guy completely turns his back on the right fielder to watch the play at third. And you just hear this whack. And I'm waiting for him to go down, but he just turns around and like it didn't hurt him at all. Since we're talking about mentors and mentorship, I hear you're working on a side project and writing a book. What's the title of said book? The book is called Umpire Mentors. So big surprise there, but it's uh, the subtitle is the best umpiring advice from the best umpires in the world. When you say I'm writing a book, it's not really written by me. I've got a hundred umpires giving me answers to questions I've asked them. Very many of those, probably 60% are top in their class. They're world-class umpires. Well, Kent, sounds like you have a world-class project on your hands. All the best in that project. And for you, the listener, if you're interested in Kent's book, once it's released, Stay tuned because we will definitely be plugging it. And when it's available, you'll find a link in our show descriptions. So stay tuned in the weeks and months ahead to find out the release date of Kent Walker's book, Umpire Mentors, the best umpiring advice from the best umpires in the world. 
Since we're on the topic of world-class umpiring, all I have to say is, wow, have you had the opportunity to check out the partnership between the British Columbia Baseball Umpire Association and the Baseball Ontario Umpire Development Committee and their Super Clinic 2021? It is phenomenal. They've had a couple so far, and I've got the opportunity to attend it and check out some of the different sections, and it is amazing. Now, let's consider some of the struggles that sports and officiating have encountered throughout the pandemic. Now add on all the various different rules that every province is putting in to try to curb the spread. Now the team that has put together the Super Clinic this year, they've tore down all the rules. They've made everything virtual. So you know what? You don't even have to leave the comfort of your own home. Now here's how it kind of goes. You log into superclinic.ca. You register, you fill out all the questions that are needed. Then the real fun begins. First, before you can attend a clinic, you have to complete what they call the mini modules. Now, depending on what level you are, there are a few of these little snippets or rule refreshers where you go in, you watch the video, you go through some scenarios, and then they put you through a couple skill testing questions, you know, just to make sure you're ready to attend the big day. Of course, the big day comes. You know, there's some music countdown. It gets really exciting. Then boom, it begins. And from there, we get to experience a fantastic day of learning and really engaging with umpires from coast to coast. It's phenomenal. At the end of the day, the team that put this together did their best to make sure that it felt like a true, authentic, in-person clinic, and I really believe that they nailed it. I'm going to send a shout out to everyone that was involved, at least from my memory. So please, if I do miss a person, hit me up in the show comments so let me know because I want to give them the recognition that they deserve. Leading the way from Ontario was Ed Quinlan and Chris Wilhelm. And from British Columbia was Rhonda Pauls and Steve Butang. Some of the instructors on the day were Adam DeCare and Corey Dalton, as well as Trevor Grieve. Then they had some major league umpires come in and provide some snippets. Trip Gibson, Hunter Wendelstadt, the most intense yoga instructor you'll ever meet, Mike Muchlinski, and Canadian Zone, an alumni from the Leading Edge Umpire Stories podcast, Stu Shearwater. Then, if you're brave enough to stay around for a little optional session, it's called Boots and 30 where Leading Edge alumni Steve Wu-Tang brings on guests from across the country and just really has a chat, talks about sports, you know, all that fun stuff that you're going to do at a clinic that you might not get to experience virtually. Well, they really even try to wrap that into this virtual clinic. Like, they've thought about everything. And just to throw it out there, they did bring on another Leading Edge umpire guest, alumni Ron Suchuk, where he did share some fantastic stories that were missed here on Leading Edge. So it was really nice to get another perspective and another interview with Ron. Now, I don't want to sound biased, but I'm going to pump the leading edge tires here for a moment. And all said and done, there were five guests total who were instructors or guests on the day. So I can assure you it was a great cast and there's a great crew looking after the future of umpiring here in Canada. Now, I know that superclinic.ca is reserved in some provinces for specific level umpires. But if you are interested in checking it out, go to superclinic.ca, contact your provincial umpire supervisory committee, find out how you can be involved because it is a jam-packed event filled with some great knowledge and some great people. So check it out. Now, just before we get to this episode, we're talking about checking things out. Check out our Facebook page, Leading Edge Umpire Stories, where you can comment, contact us, do all that fun stuff. But I just want to get it in there. Leading Edge Umpire Stories on Facebook. Go find us, look for the logo. Now, I know this has been a little bit longer intro than usual. So let's get to this episode's guest. Without further ado, Leading Edge Umpire Stories is proud to bring on a man that's been umpiring for over 40 years, has been to multiple national championships and a guy that once ate too many pierogies in Yorkton and wound up in a little Esther hazy, Trevor Stoiko. Trevor, welcome to The Leading Edge. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Trevor, pleasure's all mine like usual. It's always nice to have a fellow acquaintance and family member umpire on the show, so... We're just going to roll right into it, okay? First thing we like to do around here is we like to give the guests the opportunity to defend themselves in their playing careers. That means the first burning question is, did you play? Yeah, I yeah, in Saskatchewan I did. I played right up until about uh, midget. Two-time provincial champion. I got the final out in Bantam. I was the first baseman. Couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, but I could play defensively. And uh, I had no speed, but I could play, you know, I could. Uh, I was. I was quite... Handy with the glove. Here's the deal. There was a play at first base. Called him safe. I faked to throw it back to the pitcher. The pitcher's off the mound. The guy went off the bag. I said, thank you for the provincial title. And we won the provincial title. Take that. 
Take it that. Was back in the eighties. That's quite the story. You know, when, uh, that's the only story I have. Well, if that's the only story you have, then it's a great story. But I'm really glad that you've worked on your speed over the years. Well, I'll never forget. I played with uh, like some really good ball players and you know, guys that played hockey too. And uh, I never. I got. I got asked to steal. I think once. And Tim Shevelde, who played with uh, Detroit, he was on. He was our catcher at the time. He fouled off seven pitches in a row, and I had to call time three times. <laughs> Quite the coach you had there. Really thinking. I'm 612 pounds at 12. My God, I haven't seen my feet since, <laughs> since I was three. Why are you making me steal? It's because you kept skipping out in all those Richard Simmons workout videos. No, oh, no, this is the time of pierogies and cabbage rolls and ate a lot of it. Sounds like your Baba really looked after you, did she? About seven of them did, yes. <laughs> I added a backup Baba just in case if the Baba went <laughs> to bingo or something. <laughs> it's good to have a backup Baba. <laughs> well. And it wouldn't be uncommon at that time for Baba to go to bingo, would it? Oh, she would go seven times a day and play 612 cards, have like a three packs of smokes, and I would go with her every Friday to the Legion and play my three cards. And I remember that one time when she was playing one time, and I go, Grandma, B12, market, market, you got it. Oh, N N37, market, market, market. And she whacked me one. She says, watch your own damn card. I said, I can't. It's covered. When I was a kid, I used to clean up after bingos in my hometown. Oh, that's really good. Well, you'd be amazed how much crap is really accumulated after a bingo. This was, this is the days before the dabber. Okay. Be before the magnet. Like, this is, you You brought your own chips and everything else like that. It was, it was nuts. I know one of the best things that happened in bingo was when they eliminated smoking. That was one thing I welcomed when I had to go in and clean up afterwards. It was like you just walked into a cloud. Oh, dear God. I'd come and clean up, and you couldn't even see 10 feet in front of you. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah. It's, it was bad, man. It was terrible. Since we're talking bingo, one more thing I used to do as a kid, well, I was a punk kid, would be I'd walk down to the rec center, open up the back door, and yell, bingo, and then run. You want to hear grandma start cursing and swearing. <laughs> <laughs> we did that, too. <laughs> and one of the things that would happen was as soon as you yelled bingo, they'd say, don't touch your cards, but it didn't mm -hmm. matter. Like. There was such a trust within the community that there must have been oh. a winner that yeah. they would just take the cards, destroy them, and then... Oh, every big time. Yep. I used <laughs> to piss off grandma all the time. Another, when I got to be a bingo caller, that's the start of the broadcasting career is when, you know, you go to become a bingo caller and you go, oh, 76. <laughs> and just watch these old people. I think we lost we lost three in one night. I think two people had a heart attack and one had a stroke. There's no old 76. Who is this old guy? Who is this idiot? Get that round guy off of the table. It's really amazing what we do now and everyone just logs on their phones and plays Kino. Exactly. It's all Kino now. It's all Kino, but, or bingo online. Like, really? Where's the excitement in that? Yeah. But back to your baseball experiences. Then we talked oh, a little yeah. bit about bingo. That was it. Yeah. First time I really ever talked about bingo here in the leading edge, but let's get to it. Actually, it's the second time. I kind of made a joke a couple weeks ago about bingo and Kino. But you say that you made the last out. Looking yeah. back on this, is this kind of like a skill testing question? Kind of like Joe Carter making the out two years in a row for the Jays. Let's start by 92. Mike Timlin pitching. John Smoltz, the pinch runner on third. Bottom of the 11th inning, down 4-3. Otis Nixon at bat. Mike pitches it. Otis bunts it down the first base line. Mike flips it to Joe. There they are. Blue Jays have the first World Series. And let's do 1993. Phillies, Jays, game six in the Sky Dome. Mitch Williams is pitching. Darren Dalton is catching. Dana DeMuth is working the plate. You got Ricky Henderson at second base and Paul Molitor on first base. Joe Carter's batting. Pitches 2-2. Joe connects. Sends it down. Left field. Scrapes the wall. Home run. Jays win 8-6. Two things I love about that play. Tom Cheek's call. Touch them all, Joe. You'll never hit a bigger home run in your life. Though I'll be honest, I can't remember it from the moment, but I remember watching the game. But that call is just so sentimental to me as a Blue Jays fan. But the other thing is, Dave Phillips, you won. He bends over, takes his hat off to watch Joe touch first. I think that should be the mechanic to watch for every home run. So you get what I'm talking about. I'll throw a link in the show description, okay? Anyways, Trevor, let's get mm -hmm. back to you. Well, Were you back-to-back? -back? I got the next year. I didn't get the out. I got the single to move on. They said, do we, should we pull him? Do we do we pinch hit for this guy who's batting 076? 
or do we keep him in for his defense and his obviously base stealing abilities? I don't know. I closed my eyes and got a single that turned into a double. I don't know how I got to second base, needed to call an Uber and the, the, got the tying run. And then that's when I got pulled and we got the winning run and it was beautiful. Sounds and then for some reason they wouldn't allow us to go to nationals. I don't know. I don't have no idea why, but, but anyway, we got, we got two big awards. We were, we were excited. I'm going to dig up the constitution there from back in the early eighties. And I think Saskatchewan baseball had a rule. Nobody from Melville or York yeah, allowed yeah. to go to the national championship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was pretty much it. They hated us. Um, they still do surprisingly enough. Oh, uh, we're not going to get into that controversy here. We're going to move on. <laughs> okay. Cause you move on from playing. Yes, I did. Yes. You eventually a, get an umpiring. Do you? I got it. Well, my dad was an umpire. To okay. be honest with you, I, I got the pleasure of watching my dad umpire ye for years. And uh, he would do, like, he got to umpire Terry Poole. Oh, he was during former, that time, former major 72. leaguer. Yeah. Yeah. 72, 73, 74. And he was, he was also involved with minor baseball and that kind of stuff. He ran the show what, until uh, about maybe mid-70s and stuff like that. So I would go watch him umpire. And uh, Melville had a really good team. They won the Canadians. Uh, I think I forget when it was, and they and he umpired guys like uh, like Terry Poole, Clark Gillies. He always said he always he always was fascinated with Clark Gillies, okay, and and that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the biggest thrills for me was getting a chance to umpire with Dad. Like Dad got back and we we got to umpire and and, and so on, and that was good because he was he was getting sick after that. He he was going to keep on umpiring and that kind of stuff and. He got sick and passed away. I think it was, was it 96 or something like that? 98. I think it was 96. And I still keep, I still keep his, uh, counter. I still got his, uh, okay. Stop, hat. stop, stop. I know this, we're getting sentimental, but it's not, not called a counter. You. It's called an indicator. The indicator. Oh, yes. For, Rob for, Allen's for. fixed us up there last year. Just, just going to put that out there, but yes, keep, keep going okay. with your sentimental stuff here. Well, I'm just telling you, uh, it just, it, and then that's why I keep that stuff. I keep the indicator Thank you. Uh, in there and uh, his hat and uh, his brush Nice in my um, umpire bag. So there, yeah, that's, that's basically it. So dad still travels around with you. Uh, it, yes, he does. Yes, he does. That, you know what? That's great. Way. That, yeah. That's great. You know, we hear so much and um, some umpires are superstitious, but I think this is more sentimental. This just shows the human side of the game that, you know, you're, it's an ode to your father for helping you get into this. And and you know, I know the neat thing is at times in in certain games, like what I'll do, like when I worked uh, Wimble and that kind of stuff, and I worked WCBL and even the uh, Saskatchewan Major Baseball, I would always, you know, before the game, said, "Dad, be with me. Dad needs your help on this kind of stuff and that kind of stuff." And sometimes he would, and sometimes he would say, "You're on your own, fat ass," and go from there. <laughs> when your dad worked your games, was he tough on you? He was. He wasn't tough so much on me, but I learned something about him. He made a call, and it was a it was a it was a dribbler just off the line, that was rolling. It was going to come back. It was foul, and it was come back fair, and the guy picked it up in fair territory, and he called it foul, and he sold it. He knew he was wrong, but he sold it. And I said to him afterwards, I said, "You know, Pop," and he says, "I know," but see what happened? I made the call and stuck with it, and I learned a lot from him that day. You just you know, I, but it was just the fact that I got I got to umpire with him. That was the coolest thing. How long did yeah. you get to umpire with him? I got to like, it was just about a year or so, but, uh, it was, you know, a chance during high school in the eighties, okay. he let me, uh, he come out and do some games. Well, Trevor, since you mentioned it, let's take a quick walk down memory lane. 1973. Is it the Melville midget Elks team that wins yes. the Canadian national championship? Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that team's coached by Bob Stewart. Players are Ross Mahoney, Jason Schofer, Ian Perrin, eventual former major leaguer, as we mentioned, Terry Poole, Dale Marchuka. Garnett Keller, John Mazarek, Dick Dempster, Greg Jones, Doug Seniak, Frank Poole. He was the manager, so it must have been, was that Terry's father? Terry's dad, yeah. He passed away about three, four years ago. His mom just passed away about uh, six months ago. Okay. Uh, one thing about John Mazarek, Johnny Mazarek was better than Terry Poole. And he was a shortstop, and he was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds and did not go because he wanted to stay in Melville. He had a girlfriend, and plus he wanted to work on the farm. But he was much better than Terry Poole. So you can take the boy away from the farm, but the farm won't let the boy leave. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right, sir. Yeah. All those fields of endless gold, I guess, when you look back <laughs> on it. He became a CN guy. Fair enough. <laughs> the Reds were calling me, but the canola yeah, gold kept me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
And, you know, and there's a few other names there. Lauren Dighton, Brian Poliszczuk, Terry Graff, Mark Bell, Keith Carlson, Michael Stewart, Barrett Corpani, and last but not least, let's not forget the bat boy, Rodney Carlson. They named a ballpark in Melville, the Bob Stewart Ballpark, after Bob, Mr. Stewart. He was one of the nicest gentlemen and probably the best baseball man in Melville. And it's so nice yeah. to say that there, Trevor, because at one time, sports was very important to communities and as small communities. And I think it still is nowadays, but at one time, the community was sport. That's what communities were. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like it, it, how many times in, in small town Saskatchewan, you, every weekend, everybody went to a ball tournament. Right. You know, and you don't have that now. It, it, let it be baseball or fastball. It, that was every weekend we were busy. I know when I umpired fastball, we were gone every weekend. And that's how I made my money to go to broadcasting school was doing these tournaments. And everybody brought out their, you know, their goodies, their hamburgers and uh, their baking and everything else. So just like in, in, when it came time in wintertime, everybody brought their stuff out for the bond spiels. And that was the main thing. Now, Trevor, you mentioned that people aren't necessarily coming out for championships or tournaments anymore, but let's give an ode to Melville. They're a community that has been running a baseball tournament for over 29 years, and it's mm -hmm. huge, and it brings in a lot of teams. And, and, you know, it used to brought in a lot more, but, yeah, but it's great. It's great the fact that, it, you know, it's, it's they're keeping baseball alive in a community that no longer has a Western major baseball team. And uh, it, it's tough. It's tough for that community because, really, there's not much there. Right. That whole area, because you have, yeah, you have the CN, but the downtown is done. You know, when I, when I went back home about two years ago, well, when we, when you and I did it, yeah. did games, you know, there was nothing there. It's really too bad. And it's like that in a lot of places, not only in Saskatchewan, but Manitoba and in Alberta. Now, the reality is the world's changing and I don't know if it's the better or what, well, but I really look at sports and we really need to be community focused. We need sport to be part of the community not just something to do in the community. Because you look back on this 73 team, Terry Poole actually signed his intent to play in Major League Baseball at the Houston Astros after that 1973 championship mm -hmm. when he met scout Wayne Morgan. Exactly. And it's you, you don't see that anymore. And you go back decade, decade, decade. My uncle was uh, was scouted, uh, who was it, by, I think it was the Yankees or something like that. They would come down into Saskatchewan and see these prairie ball players. I had two or three uncles and a couple of cousins, uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, were drafted or were looked at, but would not leave. The parents would not let them leave. They'd stay on the farm. There's a lot of that. Well, it sounds like the Yankees, don't they pay players to play against them so they beat them? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Yankees sign everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Name me someone who they own signed, yeah. Okay, this is one of our famous post-show edits. Got to give a shout-out to Melville Minor Baseball, where this year, 2021, between July 9th and 11th, the Melville Minor Baseball Association will be celebrating their 29th annual baseball tournament. This tournament will feature a limit of 16 U11 AAA teams, 16 U13 AAA teams, 8 U15 AAA teams, and 8 U18 AAA teams. If you are interested in registering in that or hearing more about it, please contact Melville AAA Tournament at Outlook.com or call Tourism Melville at 1-306-728-6840. Good luck, Melville. Now back to the show. Who are some of the guys you work with there in small town Saskatchewan over the years? Uh, who did I work with? Uh, Larry Schrader. Oh, Larry Schrader is definitely a name that's very common in the southeast yeah. part of Saskatchewan, isn't he? Oh, he is, big time. You, what, what, you know, you mentioned you mentioned the uh, tournament. One of the best things that happened uh, with the ball tournament, there would be Chad Wagner, myself, Drury would come down, and Stu for the Melville tournament. And my mom looked forward to it each and every year because they'd stay at my place. Chad, Stu, and Larry, they'd all stay at my place, or my mom's place, and they just loved it. You know, I've known Stu for forever, and they would come down and do tournaments, and we'd have a blast. We'd have a blast. That was that was one of the biggest things that I learned was, uh, you know, working with them. You know, Murray Busis doesn't get enough credit. I worked with Murray. No, he doesn't. One of those guys that, uh, one of the hardest working people you'll ever meet, and one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Biggest heart. And, yeah, biggest heart. And uh, he works so hard, and he has he gives it all, and 
and he, he what he's he's such an influential guy to uh people in melville he really is yes. it's good to work with him i've worked with you know everybody in in the province of saskatchewan some great ones in alberta uh you know all across canada i've worked with all of them so it's uh but the ones that stand out for sure larry you know elmer uh Stu, of course very proud of that well it's quite interesting that you mentioned that you've worked championships with trevor Stu, uh, chad wagner and some of those guys because Trevor Drury alluded to back on his episode when he appeared with us, and Stu even talked about making the trips out to Melville. One of the stories that Stu and Trevor shared was uh, potentially that Stu and Chad hit a deer on the way. Not surprising. But you tell us you learned a lot. What did you learn? Well, but the biggest thing is how to uh, work a game, how to be a gentleman, how to how to work a game. You know what I mean? To be a professional and you know we all make mistakes right except who you are you know what i mean earn respect you don't demand it you earn it working these players and, and, and how to work players and and personalities and so on you know I, I go out there i'm gonna have fun i'm gonna do the best job i possibly can i'm gonna work as hard as i can you will too and i'm gonna give you the best game i possibly can yes you know and that's what i learned from these guys that's what i learned about doing things and 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 in the process not only do you, you know, learn from each other, but you, it's, it's a case of you work off each other and uh, the memories. God, the memories are something else. That's the big thing for me. You know, the friendships and the memories. It, you know, uh, when I go to these tournaments, these, you know, it, it may it be baseball, may it be fastball, may it be wherever. It, it seems like baseball and the game gets in the way. It's the friendships and the memories that you make. Right. You know, seriously, like I say, the memories that you and I have, like that, that will always remain with me. Thinking of memories with those Millville tournaments, what's one of the biggest memories you have? Biggest memory, uh, let's see. Oh, I'll never forget this. Um, uh, it was, I think it was Saskatchewan Major at the time or whatever the case may be. Lane Miko, good friend of mine. A lot of people in the area would probably remember Lane. He was uh, one of the best athletes best ball players i've ever worked with better see best ball player i've ever seen he could hit a ball i think jamie heward is the only other guy that could hit a ball farther than lane miko could and lane who unfortunately passed away he needed a heart transplant and never got one he died in 2000 and i remember doing a game and this was during the tournament doing western major baseball league games so the place is packed there's a play at second base i remember being in the infield and uh there's a hit to the shortstop and this is Malvo's playing, I think Moose Jaw or something like that. No, Swift Current, Swift Current. And there's a flip to, there's going to be a flip to the second baseman routine, right? So we got the out. All of a sudden the second baseman decides he's not going to be there. So it's a run to the second base. It's a race to the second base bag. And the Melville player beat the shortstop by, I'd say two and a half miles. And I put my hand out and it was supposed to be safe and it came out out. And I go, Jesus, you're not supposed to be out. <laughs> you're not <laughs> out. Oh my God, why is that hand there? You're not out. So everybody's losing there. And, and you know, and I, this guy's going to lose his mind, and he has every right to. The uh, third base umpire comes out and says, This is how it is. You blew that call. And I go, Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I did. Well, are we going to put him back? No, sir. So Lane comes out and he says, we going to the bar afterwards? Yep. You buying? Yep. <laughs> and I did. And if it wasn't for the fact that I won the 50 50 two innings later, <laughs> <laughs> I said, Yeah, it's all on me, boys. Go nuts. Yeah, you learn from those mistakes. But guess what? When you take a few dollars home, it doesn't hurt at the end of the night either. Well, you know what? And then that's the thing. You, you remember stuff like that. I, I, I can't remember a good. You, may, you remember the bad calls and you do the, the good ones. You know what I mean? Right. It's just one of those things. And I'll be honest with you, over the years, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've also gotten a lot of calls right, and I'll mm -hmm. save those stories for another day. But I'll be honest, I rarely remember the situations on the field. And I'll be honest, unless they're really bad situations or bad experiences, like when I have to deal with rat bastards, and unfortunately remember kind of the negative stuff, but quite rarely will I ever remember any plays that happen on the field. But I always remember the good times and the experiences away from the field. Right. Like the car rides, the trips in 18 passenger vans, or when we're playing jokes behind people's backs. Those are the things that really stick with me. When I hear stories about, you know, people coming out and staying at your house and having a few meals 
Like you said, you had a couple mm -hmm. babas. She must've looked right after those guys. Mm -hmm. I really think yeah. that's important. And to hear that your mother was really excited to have them. It really talks about the family and the community of umpiring. It really warms my heart. And I just love hearing those stories. Well, and, th and that's, and that's what you always remember. You know, that's what you always remember. Mom, that was my mom's summer. She loved it. She loved Larry. She loved, you know, doing that kind of thing. You know, she just had such a wonderful, wonderful time. Right. And it was, it was something that you look forward to and it sticks with you. Just like pierogies, they stick to you. Oh, dobre. I don't know what that means, but. Neither do I. I think I made it up. I don't know. Fair enough. But I'll, I'm going to be honest with you. If we're going to talk Ukrainian food, definitely not a fan of the cabbage rolls. That's not me. Are you kidding me? Not, I, I don't have a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, that's the best thing for you. No, can't do it. I don't know why, can't do it, but I can definitely slam the, coil, the sausage coil and a pint of sour yeah. cream. Yeah. The Cuba side, well, you're, yeah. you're two thirds there. You're two thirds there. <laughs> and sorry, can't do the borscht. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know. I'm gonna throw right. If we're going to throw daggers, I'm going to throw them all right. Oh, my God. I, I, think, I, I think I pulled a groin. <laughs> Thank God, man. You know what one of the most interesting things out here in Saskatchewan is? What's that? You can go to a Chinese food buffet, and you mm -hmm. go through it, and you're getting to the end of it, and somehow at the end of the buffet, there's always a pan of pierogies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those god-awful chivos. And, and I don't understand it. Like, yeah. who eats egg rolls and pierogies? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What did you have today? Chicken balls, rice, and pierogies. Yeah. And a lot of jello. Yeah. A lot so, of orange jello. <laughs> so for if anyone ever travels through Saskatchewan, you stop at a Chinese food restaurant and you get to the end of the buffet, don't be surprised when you see the pierogies. It's just yeah. the way it is. Yeah. Pierogies, jello, and really bad cookies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unreal. But you wow. are expected to shuffle down a couple of pierogies, so keep some room for the pierogies. Oh, they are terrible, brother. They are terrible. Uh, oh. A little bacon, a little onion, sour cream. Uh, mm. Oh, God. You can make them good. Yuck. <laughs> and this is a post show edit. Just talking about this quickly because Trevor mentioned the name Lane Miko. Lane was a resident of Melville, Saskatchewan. Unfortunately, he passed away at the age of 29 while waiting for a heart transplant in Ontario. I was able to find reference to Lane in a book called Acceptance is Not Surrender, A Little Girl, an Old Man, and One Man's Story of Hope by William Sutherland. If you check our show description, you're going to find a link to a book preview in Google. And on page 183, it talks about Lane and Lane makes some comments about the Western Canadian Baseball League. There's also a little bit of inspiration on what Lane brought to the world in the few preview pages that are available. Now, considering that we've done a few public service announcements in the past regarding mental health, drinking and driving, I think it's only fit that given the circumstances with Mr. Lane Miko, that I put a link in the show description about blood, organ and tissue donations and where you can go to register to donate after you've deceased so that you can potentially help other people live. Now, I respect that it can be difficult for people to have the conversation on what they would like done with their body after they've died. No one wants to think about that. But if you think it out, register to donate, and talk it over with your family, it can only make it easier to swallow when the inevitable happens. So just remember, if you do decide to donate, you are saving a life. But let's not talk no more about this morbid stuff, and let's get back to the show. Okay, Trevor, outside of Melville, where are some of the other communities that you've had the opportunity to work in over the years? Oh my God, I've worked all over the place, brother. This radio job is taking me flipping all over the place. Where's all I've over worked, the place? Ah, uh, Thunder Bay. I've worked in VC. I've worked in uh, Edmonton. Uh, worked a little bit in Calgary. Worked Regina. Did a lot of Regina. Worked a lot with the good Regina guys. Uh, some of the Moose Jaw guys uh, in Winnipeg. Did Winnipeg for a while. Mostly Very fastball in Winnipeg, but uh, I worked with a lot of Winnipeg guys. Uh, the Maritimes worked uh, in Halifax. Worked a little bit in St. John. Uh, some in uh, I worked some in Ottawa when I was doing uh, some Kingston work. I did Kingston, Ottawa. Met some really nice people there. So the great thing is with this radio job, I, not only have I met some really wonderful radio people and been fired from every job I've had, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I've got to work with some really nice people, you know, really great people along the way. Uh, Sean Roach, I remember him from Ottawa, despite being a liberal, he's a nice guy. Uh, <laughs> Oh, did I say something wrong? Oh, was that was that too political? Uh, I know they've just been really, really nice guys. Been doing really good ball and uh, getting, getting the, what I really enjoy is doing like the Western Major League, the college leagues, and uh, you know having a chance to do uh, all this different work. Been running this show for almost a year now. I have not mm -hmm. heard God and politics in the same sentence. Oh, really? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we like to refrain from that here on the leading edge. So, <laughs> one of the th all I want is a hat or a jersey. That's all I want. Yeah, we're gonna have to survive this interview first before we actually get that stuff out. But one of the things you talk about, you've been all over the country, and this is one of the things that I've had the opportunity to experience moving from the east coast to the prairies. Is that umpiring has provided me an in to my community. Oh, absolutely. And everywhere I've gone. You meet people, and if you get into umpiring, the community's kind of like, hey, you umpire in town. Let's give this guy a chance. Mm -hmm. and, and that's your in. That is your in. It's like doing a service club. And uh, you get to meet just, such, you know, coaches, fans, and everything else like that, depending on the caliber of ball you do. You know, if you're doing uh, you know, a peewee game and that kind of stuff, you get to meet everybody there, depending on the caliber you do. It's, it's wonderful. And you're right. It's the way to get in. And uh, and then you work your way to doing some uh, top caliber ball. Like I say, I'm I'm new in the uh, Kootenays here, and I'm just starting to meet new people. Oh yeah, and every province has the people that are like, welcome, come. You know, here's how it here's how it goes. You'll get to learn about the town. You'll get to learn who you want to see, who you want to avoid. Won't take mm -hmm. too long to really figure out all the ins and outs of how the community works. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I remember <laughs> my first time getting into Regina. I got into Regina radio and I got into the umpires there and everything else. And I remember who was it? Uh, Larry or somebody was telling me about this one league. It was uh, not a non-sanctioned league and <laughs> had this catcher who refused to wear a mask. And they were, the ruling is you wear a mask or we're throwing you out. So he wouldn't wear a mask. We don't go by your rules. So I said, well, here's, here's your choice. You got a choice to, uh, if you don't wear the mask, you don't get to wear a glove. So you got a choice. <laughs> you wear the glove, you wear the mask. You wear the mask, you wear the glove. It's not a tough game. So after the game's over, he comes up to me and freaking decks me. No, dear, that's wrong. He freaking duck drops me. <laughs> like, what, do the hell's, what the hell's going on? Sounds like you're in Nippewa, Manitoba. It's like, where the hell am I? This is Regina, for God's sake. Oh. Yeah, I think he got three or four games, and I never did that league again. I can't remember what league it is. It's in Regina. I have no idea, but I remember a guy <laughs> dropped me like a lead pipe. It's like, holy crap. We can say crap on radio, for God's sake. Sure you can, Trevor. We'll take your word for it. But that's quite the story. I've been verbally abused and verbally threatened in my life, but I've never been physically assaulted after or during a game. I'm sure lots would like to. Uh, it's worse than wrestling, I'll tell you that much. And we're going to get to that in a bit. Okay. But all your years of umpiring, you've worked up through the provincial championship experience. Do you have any mm -hmm. national championships under your belt? I've got a lot in, in fastball. I've got three in, in uh, well, two, technically three because of uh, COVID. I never got to go to my bandum. I did uh, U13 years ago, and I got to do juniors about 20-some years ago when it, when the rules were different and everything else. It was a great experience. Um, Where was that? And then I did – it was in Thunder Bay. It was in Thunder Bay, and then I ended up working radio in Thunder Bay years later, and I ended up working through radio. I was doing a, a classic rock station, and I got to umpire Alice Cooper. I've worked uh, on, on the fastball side. I've done junior men's, junior ladies, senior ladies twice, uh, senior men's twice, uh, midgets and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I've done in total about 11 Canadians. Okay, between baseball and fastball. Exactly. Now, this is a baseball primary podcast, and I just want to get it out I'm there. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. But I want to get it out there for my own verbiage. What is the proper terminology some places in the country we hear fastball. Some places we hear softball. What is the formal? I'd say fastball. Women say, you know, women's softball, ladies' softball, and men's fastball. I, you call it what you want. I really yeah. think uh, you can go to call it women's fastball. You know, that's that's the future. Like, ladies' ball is the future. Men's fastball, you know, it was the, you know, at the pinnacle. There's a lot of great teams. Now, that's starting to die. 
slow pitch has really taken a big chunk out of umpiring out of out of the men's game and that kind of stuff. And I really think thanks to this pandemic, uh, it's going to make things a lot tougher in the men's game. I know uh, where we were in Alberta, there's two or three teams that are competitive uh, in BC. There's one major team. You go to Canadians, there's not much left. There's right. not much left. So the ladies game, of course, they're there in the Olympics. The Olympics are going. Uh, we've got, I think, two or three Canadian umpires and there are lady umpires there. The big push in the fastball game is lady umpires, which is great to see. And, you know, over the years, from my memory and knowing a few people within that game, you'd see Team Canada seem to always be just Team Newfoundland. Newfoundland kind of had a are. dominance. Yeah, they still are. I did my one of my best tournaments was in 2013 and Newfoundland owned they had they had uh, team Canada pitchers like guys the guys the guys are making money going doing this sort of thing there's wow. there's a you know they make 50 60 maybe a, six figures throwing you know pitching they look for pitchers it's a pitching game it's a pitcher's game oh yeah you know you can have a game that lasts 45 minutes right really seven inning ball game an hour really and it's it's different but that I think those days are gone I really think those days are gone I think uh you know, the game was struggling as it is, and I think this is really going to hurt it. I'm, I'm hearing 25, 30% of the umpires may be done. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's just that small of a circuit now. and doesn't. It, it really is. It re really, really is. It's really too bad. No, we don't like to see that. We don't like to see any attrition because I do think that softball, fastball brings people to the game of baseball. I think it does. And I think pe people in baseball are brought to the game of softball. I think they, they, they really do complement each other. They absolutely do. There's a lot of fastball umpires that do baseball. Now, when it comes right down to it, which which one do I prefer? I prefer baseball. Give me baseball. Give me a baseball game, a good baseball game. It's a game within a game. And you know, the more competitive games like the Western, like WCBL, uh, AAA Midget, or whatever the case is, or AAA U18, U21, or whatever you want to say, a good baseball game, you know, you can't beat it. It's, you, special. it's a game within a game. Yes. So, Trevor, you said that you worked the national championships in 98 in Thunder Bay, and then a couple years later, you land a job in town. When were you in Thunder Bay to work? I think it was 21, uh, 2001 to 2003, something like that. I remember uh, the championships were there in uh, Thunder Bay, and Shuchuk, Ronnie Shuchuk, was the UIC. Okay. And I had him on the air because, because he, was, he was actually at my first ever – provincial when i was 14 i umpired at the age of 14 they had to get special permission to allow me to umpire i was in yorkton it was him and uh uh sobco bill sobco were the umpires bill sobco myself and ron suchuk i'll never forget that that was one of that i should mention that earlier but anyway he was there and i had him on the air and we got talking about him working the olympics and everything else it was really good we had a long interview and it was wonderful and i i remember him saying he, he mentioned the story one time that he was talking about a uh, Ontario umpire who had a really big head, thought he was all that in a bag of chips. And I, Ron Suchuk can put a guy, can explode a guy's head in three simple words. And he's, he's telling, well, well, he goes to this guy and says, well, how many pitches did you miss? He said, I don't think I missed a pitch. I think, I'll tell you honestly, Suchuk says, you missed two pitches. And he says, really? Oh, it's really good. Yeah, you missed the curveball and the fastball. <laughs> <laughs> Explode! <laughs> oh, ever since then, man, I've I've always been a Ron Suchuk fan, man. The names he comes up with when they ask him who's doing the game, I'm this, I'm that, I'm Jim, last name Nasium. I love that stuff. I use that on the air. That's gold, Jim. <laughs> that's gold, Jerry. I agree. Uh, well, that's quite the feedback to give an umpire. Come in. All, no. all excited. <laughs> That'll ground an individual real quickly. Oh, it was classic, man. Now, earlier you mentioned that you had the opportunity to umpire Alice Cooper. Yes. How'd that come about? So we're in with Thunder Bay, right? And uh, Alice Cooper was doing a few shows in Thunder Bay. And they wanted to, they had a few nights off. So they wanted to play slow pitch with us. Like their group against our group. And so they, we decided to, you know, have do it at the at the ballpark where the uh, I think it was the Border Cats played, and there was some ball beforehand. So we're playing scrub out in the uh, out in the ball field, and their entire uh, crew, a band, uh, you know, and and the rowdies and the guys in charge of uh, 
uh, what do you call it, uh, guys in charge of promotional gear and all that kind of stuff that are out there. So we're out there, you know, snagging balls, and all of a sudden, hey, nice catch, old man. Holy crap, you're Alice Cooper. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> Can't miss it. You know it. who you are? <laughs> yeah. And and so what happened was um, people get coming in, and I said, and we had we uh, gave them all the beer and uh, all the you know, food and everything they want underneath, you know, where the players in the dressing rooms and all that. And we got talking, and, and I met Alice's daughter. And, I, I, you know, there was instant. She just had that attitude, eh? So her and I clicked. Her and I clicked. And, she, you know, she was all over me, let's be honest. Like, look at me. And she was. <laughs> no comment. So, uh, yeah. So I said, to, I said to her, I said, come on, let's just, let's just go make out. Let's just go make out. So she grabs my arm and goes up to Alice. Dad, I'm leaving the drummer. I'm going with this guy. What's your name? <laughs> <laughs> Is your ever? <laughs> and so, so that was my in with Alice, right? So I said, can we do, and this was just after, uh, what was that movie? Oh, God, Wayne's World. When he, oh, no, wow. he bows, we're not worthy. Yes. So I'm the MC umpire. And I said, do you mind if we do this, Alice? Right. I go up and before I introduce you, you come up to bat and I do, we're not worthy. So he says, yeah, go ahead. So I, he comes up to bat. Ladies and gentlemen, Alice Cooper, we're not worthy. And I do that. And the fat guy goes down and bows to him. If he doesn't go 11 for 11 that day. <laughs> and he says he was signing autographs for about an hour and a half afterwards. And he says, of course, Alice is a big golfer, right? Yeah. So I said, Alice says to me, well, you're a radio guy. You don't have any golf courses in town. I said, well, I could probably get you on this one. You think you can? I said, you're Alice Cooper. I'll see if I can <laughs> twist a few arms. <laughs> yes. So he says, don't tell anybody on the air, but come golf with me the next day. And I got to golf with Alice Cooper like uh, at 9 o'clock the next day. Uh, I birdied the first hole. The guy played. He's a scratch golfer. He was amazing. Oh, really? Oh, he's oh, he's that's that that's his drug now. After he gave up drugs and booze and everything else like that, he says he plays thirty six a day, and he, and he tells stories of golfing with, you know, people like um, Costner, Kenny G, uh, oh Trump, Trump surprising cheats. He said <laughs> I went golfing with Donald Trump and he cheated. <laughs> you learn that here in Leading Edge, people. Donald Trump cheats in his golf game. I didn't think you'd expect to hear that tonight. So yeah, yeah what are the odds? Trevor, that is quite the celebrity to get paired to golf with. Now, I got a little confession here to make. One time I showed up at the golf course in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, and I got paired with seven-time Canadian Pro Rodeo Entertainer of the Year, two-time Canadian Finals Rodeo Clown Barrelman, three-time Dodge Ram National Circuit Finals Rodeo, and the 2016 NFR alternate Dennis Halstead. That guy could golf, I tell you. Those rodeo clowns, they can golf. Oh, no way. Yep, pretty cool. Like I said, he could golf. He could definitely drive the ball, but his putting was unbelievable. You know what they say, drive for show, Sweet. putt for no. Like you said, these these guys that tour all day, they seem to be all good golfers. They know what they're doing. You know who's a good golfer? Willie Nelson. I golfed with Willie Nelson. Really? He was, he, he, you know, he, he, I think, I'd say he's probably a oh. five handicap. That. He smoked the seventh green. It was amazing. He was smoking the seventh green. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Trevor, let's move on from golf. You've talked about it a couple times, but let's really focus and hammer on it for a few minutes here. You talked sure. about the Saskatchewan Major Baseball League and your work within the WMBL and WCBL over the years. Mm -hmm. How'd you get into that league? God, I mean, I think it was just because I was in Melville and they needed umpires. To be honest with you, big fish, and, small town. Uh, sometimes those are the opportunities that are presented. Exactly, and I think where I got to do some games with uh, some uh, Regina guys and that, because uh, I I worked not only did I when I got into Regina I worked Larry uh, Elmer and that kind of stuff, but I also worked that other league uh, I, uh, with the uh, it was the Cyclones at the time. I can't remember what it was called, and there was Moose Jaw. I think Saskatoon was in it. There was American teams. I remember back, uh, one of the nice things about it is, and it was only about two years ago, I had the pleasure of being on Peary Field. Uh, 40 years later, Terry Poole came back, and they dedicated a uh, portion of Peary Field to him and uh, the street to Terry Poole. And uh, my dad did that back in the 70s, early 70s. I had the pleasure of being on that same ballpark 40 years later. And that, that memory will always stay with me. That will always, always stay with me. It was very, very special. And it was one of the many different memories that I've had working uh, that league for so long. 
Yeah, it's a nice toast to what Melville did for Terry and for the baseball community itself. Now, you mentioned one thing that's special and one thing that people haven't talked about too much here is that the Cyclones, was that part of that Prairie Independent League for a few years? That That's that's what it was, yes. I remember doing a few games or a few years with that. Uh, there would be uh, myself, uh, Larry. Um, I think uh, Elmer did that. I'm just trying to think who else was in that. Maybe Chad might have done a few games. Yeah, it was in that Independent League. We did... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, work with them, uh, people from uh, Moose Jaw. What was it? Uh, like, uh, I think it was uh, Rocky Nickel did a few. Um, uh, who else was there? Like, oh, uh, Haley. Haley did that. Rick uh, Haley. Lauren, you know, Lauren, the one that passed from uh, uh, Weyburn. And uh, it was it was good ball. It was really, really good ball. I remember one time we had a, we had a game. I was doing the dish uh, with Elmer and Larry, and they had Daryl Boston way past his prime you know he used to play with the yankees i think boston for a while uh daryl boston came he could turn a triple into a single he was one of those <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> sounds like a guy you looked up to yeah yeah pretty good. He, had, he had trevor stoico speed <laughs> he had garden gnome speed and uh it was an inside pitch two two pitch with loaded cans i ring him up for strike three and i, I thought hey, it's not going to react he went ballistic on me and he's chewing snuff, and it's going all over my uniform, and it's on my face, and it's it's just going toe to toe. And I'm scared. He's like six foot a thousand. I'm five foot nothing, and uh, I'm looking at Larry, and I'm looking at Elmer. They're laughing. They're just laughing, and I'm covered in spit. <laughs> it's one of my biggest memories from that. And then afterwards, I never. They ended up. The Cyclones ended up winning the ball game that game. I threw him. I eventually threw him because he told him, "Give him some time. Give him some time." And he wouldn't give up. I tried moving. You know, he. We. It was watching two little uh, manatees <laughs> oh. walk at the same time. It was like boom at the same time. So we ended up throwing him out. And it wasn't until after the game when they won, they came after it. And he said, you know, he had a lot of guts to do that. And I said, well, thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was still, was still shaking after that. We often hear that about independent baseball. It's a fight every night. And those guys are, you know, working for a paycheck hard and hoping to put food in the table. Get to that next level Maybe. again. <laughs> some are going up and some are going down. Now in that league, I don't know if we really talked about it before here in the leading edge, but that league had a dozen or so teams, Aberdeen, Pheasants, Minot, Mallards, Moose Jaw, Diamond Dogs, Grand Forks, Varmints, Brainerd, Bobcats, the Regina Cyclones, Southern Mini Stars, the Dakota Rattlers, Saskatoon Smoking Guns, Green Bay Sultans, and then the Brandon Gray Owls. Wow. And I know that on another episode with Blaze LeVay, we quickly talked about a guy by the name of John or Hatch Can at American Machine New Brunswick. I believe he played for the Moose Jaw Diamond Dogs for a few years or one season during that tenure when that league was running. But... It didn't really stay too long here in the Saskatchewan area or even in the northern western part of the Americas, but that was a league that played 80 games a year. Like that, yeah. I mean, they were going every night. Game. Yeah, exactly. And that I think that played – that's it's tough to uh, maintain. Yeah. You know, it really is. You know, you got to have the crowds. You got to have everything, promotional things and everything going. That's a big schedule. What was Regina or Moose Jaw and those guys bringing into that time for fan base? Uh what we saw, not bad, not bad. A little bit better what it was in the Western Major League Baseball League. And then it died off. It, you know, they. I remember working a packed crowd in Moose Jaw, but it was Moose Jaw versus Regina. Fair, and I could see that because Moose Jaw to Regina is about seventy kilometers, fifty minute drive. You know, the, so you're gonna that's a, that's a gimme. But other than that, it was uh, got it. Of course, that was so many years ago. But uh, now we've heard Moose Jaw in previous episodes. I mean, Moose Jaw runs a very small field there at Roswell's Park, and I think a full crowd would be 500 people. Pretty but much. People do say that the atmosphere there, even though there's 500 people there, it's crammed, it's packed. Those people actually <laughs> sit above the plate, and there's a special feeling there in Moose Jaw with the crowds. It really is, and and, and it was when when they played. It was a real good atmosphere. They let you know if you missed one. They let you know if they didn't like what they said and, you know, if they, and, uh, but they were fair once you left the ballpark. Well, most of them. Now a guy like you, they'd probably be better yeah. off letting you know when you did not miss one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah pretty much. Yeah. Hey, great job. And I'm missing that one. <laughs> yeah. Lard ass. <laughs> well, one of the things that I really enjoy doing here and one of the opportunities that I have is, or we both have, is that we've had the opportunity to work full time on the Western Canadian baseball league circuit. And I got to mm -hmm. say, when you look at umpiring and look at the camaraderie and 
the opportunities that that affords umpires here in Western Canada, I'm very thankful for it. One of the things that the league does is that they do put up umpires that are working full-time in accommodations. You might do travel. You might work six games and seven nights. You get the opportunity to feel like a professional umpire for a few weeks yes. a year. And that's where you and I got the opportunity to meet. Now, one of the things that they do, and when I say they, I'm going to shout out Andrew Higgins, John Oko, and Chris Hartley have been some of the key figures over the past couple of years that have looked after that. So I want to say thank, thank you, you guys. Yes. Thank you. And they put you up in accommodations. We got the opportunity to stay at the Regina, <laughs> University of Regina campus dorms. I have to say it sounds crazy. Like, oh, you're going to spend the whole summer in a dorm. But you know what? The memories that are made, the stories that we have, oh. it's fun. Oh, I had a blast. Oh, yeah. My favorite part of the whole experience is the opportunity to eat the buffet every day for <laughs> a few weeks. Like, I'm a big fan of chicken fingers, if you want my honest opinion. I like borscht. I heard that your favorite item on the menu is Thursday goat. Any truth to that? <laughs> Here's the deal. You know, if you're going to serve this, let me know ahead of time. <laughs> it takes three seconds to put a slab of paper and G-O-A-T. That's all I needed. Little backstory to this is that the way that the cafeteria is set up is they pick a ethnic food group every meal so one night you're eating hungarian or ukrainian the next mm -hmm. night you're going to eat mexican next night you might have a little chinese and then on a thursday night or every thursday night was afghan night so we go through the lineup and we're going through it's like okay what's this and you get to the meat part and it's goat <laughs> i you know what my stomach can handle a lot but i'm not really interested in trying goat the first time before i'm about to work a plate in swift current no, yeah, not yeah, happening. Yeah, cool. That was bad. <laughs> I'm willing to risk a lot to go to Swift Current, but I'm not willing to risk trying goat for the first time. So we had to and pass on that. You were good that night. You were very good that night. <laughs> so we stopped in Moose Jaw for a Tim Hortons. And that actually, after having that in my stomach, I probably should have had the goat. You want my honest opinion? <laughs> but in all fairness, I got to say thank you too to the people in the Regina campus because you know what that, that, that cafeteria definitely allowed me to put on a solid eight or nine pounds in three weeks Didn't well, take it was three weeks for me it was like two days <laughs> yeah. food Didn't delicious one of our umpires eat 16 fingers in a row do we really want to go there right now i'm not going to talk about that story here in the leading edge we'll we'll save that for <laughs> another day okay now trevor since we met a long time ago i've heard some rumors about you i heard that you were involved in professional wrestling yes I used to be a pro wrestler, used to be a pro wrestler, referee, manager, you name it. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had a guy named Steve Butang. He goes by the alias, the Cuban assassin or Lou Albano. He wouldn't really delve into how he got into professional wrestling, but can you share with us how somebody starts to become a professional wrestler? Uh, a, a lot of booze, a lot of booze. No, uh, what? <laughs> I, I, I've loved wrestling from day one. Like I say, Dad and I, we used to watch Stampede Wrestling out of Calgary when we were young. I, that's the reason why I got into radio. Why well, I got into broadcasting. I wanted to be Ed Whalen. In between time, and that kind of thing, I wanted to be Ed Whalen. So what I did is I started announcing for uh, shows out of uh, Ed, uh, Regina, and I would get booed a lot. I would get booed a lot. And then I started enjoying it. And then I started practicing with these guys. And then I learned the moves and they said, well, why don't you become a manager? So I became a manager and went there. And then they said, why don't you come to Calgary, go to the heart uh, dungeon and learn the uh, moves at the dungeon. So we ended up doing that. And I became a wrestler, be became a pro wrestler. I went as Squiggy Magoo. Uh, I went as the Pierogi Prince. And I also go as Squiggy Tuscadero. That was my name. So yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I never won a match. <laughs> um, how many times have you competed i've been in oh i've been in the ring count like i've done it for about 15 years uh when i i wrestled people like uh, the cuban assassin uh i've worked uh nikolai volkov he punched me square in the nose uh, i'll never forget that that's not a wrestling move is it 
no, he <laughs> kind of got too. I was the gimmick was I was supposed to stop him in mid. You know, he sings the Russian national anthem, right? And he was such an amazing athlete. Like he was my favorite wrestler. He was one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And he was in the dressing room and he was singing uh, Dean Martin. He was singing opera. The guy had a voice. He was just an amazing human being. And I was supposed to. The gimmick was I stop him uh, when he starts singing and I attack him. So we go through the gimmick and everything else like that. We go through the moves, and then he punches me. But he actually punched me square in the nose. <laughs> and I said, I got punched in the nose by Nikolai Volkov. I'm so happy to this day. But uh, I worked with the Hearts, worked Bret Hart, uh, worked with uh, Davey Boy Smith when he was alive. Uh, Jim Neidhart worked him when he was alive. So and uh, Paul Orndorff, I'm just trying to remember who else was there. And all these people. It was wonderful. It was a blast. Scott Steiner. Oh, wow. Now, I've already yeah, mentioned yeah. about the Cuban assassin and Steve Wu-Tang. Just to confirm, mm -hmm. did you wrestle Steve or did you wrestle the Cuban assassin? Because we don't want to get this stuff mixed up. Not here on the leading edge. Okay. It was definitely, <laughs> yeah, he does that a lot. If, if Steve goes, <laughs> a lot, then it's the Cuban assassin. No, the Cuban assassin, he was, he looks, no, that was the Cuban assassin. And it was really, really cool because I got to wrestle him and then his son who's the Cuban assassin junior. We had a tag match and he hit me with a chair and he won. <laughs> Punched the nose hit with the chair. No, oh, yeah, I, I've been, I've, like I say, I've been hit pretty hard a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Considering you were an announcer, were you like the heel man? I was, I was heel. I love playing heel. Heel is so easy to play yeah, and I loved it. Like it is the best thing to play because days. if you can get the crowd booing at you and everything else like that, you got it made. And I remember I, I asked my mom to come watch me in a show but I had to tell her, you don't know me. She says, what do you know? You know you're know, you my son. She says, you don't know me. And I came out and everybody's booing me and everything else, throwing stuff at me and all that kind of stuff. And 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 you, you're right away, you got the instant pop, right? I right. just forgot to tell my mom that I was going through a table that <laughs> night. And she, was, she was quite shocked. That's my boy. That's my boy. Thank you. She was white. I said, I am never going to a show to watch you do that again. <laughs> Well, who is your favorite wrestler all time then? My favorite wrestler was Nikolai Volkov. I, I think uh, Nikolai Volkov, Rowdy Roddy Piper was my favorite. He could he can get a crowd going right away. He was by far my favorite. By far my favorite. Did you ever get the opportunity to watch him perform live once he got to the WWF? No, unfortunately not. No, he was he was based out of Winnipeg. He got his first start when he was sixteen. I I knew the. Uh, I worked with the uh, promoter when, you know, that gave him his first start, uh, Tony Candelo out of Winnipeg. You know, I worked with a lot of matches there, but uh, no, I never got a chance to see him. I wish I could have. I got to see Andre work. I got to see Hogan, you know. Uh, Hogan was a terrible wrestler. He was horrible. The Rock was, Rock will always be the best on the mic, on the stick ever. He'll always be the best on the stick. That must be because of his three-game experience with the Calgary Stampeders. But I'm pumped. XFL and CFL, they should join. Go DC Defenders. You're a Saskatchewan Rough Rider fan, right? Oh, God, no. Oh, can't stand the Riders. <laughs> Go Edmonton Football Club, whatever we're called. Yeah, whatever we're called. <laughs> uh, Just a boy lost in a big city. <laughs> yes. We're moving into a section of the show that everyone seems to like. It's called 10 Questions. Trevor, I've already asked you a ton of questions, but let's talk. I'm going to ask you 10 questions. I just really want your honest opinion. And if I like your mm -hmm. answer, I'm going to give you a... We can debate it. We mm. cannot move on. If I don't like it. Nice. Pretty straightforward. Okay. What is your favorite Ghostbusters movie? Marshmallow Man or Vigo? Marshmallow Man. Oh, for God's sakes. Yeah. You're 0 for 1. Just like your batting career. <laughs> oh, no. Vigo's where it's at, man. Vigo was scary. Like Marshmallow Man. Which one was your favorite Ghostbuster? Uh, what was his name? Rick Moranis. He made me laugh. Can't go wrong with a good Canadian kid, but I was a big fan of Bill Murray. Nah, everybody goes Bill Murray. Oh, come on. Bankman and all his scientific, unscientific studies. Yeah. Oh, they were good. Come on. They were funny. Mm. Okay, let's go next question then. Okay, been in the radio business a long time. What's a tune that always, you know, no matter what time of the day, you can put it on and you know the listeners are just loving it? Life is a Highway. Life is a Highway, man. That's my favorite song. And now that you're rocking country music, you must be playing the Rascal Flats version a little bit, are you? No! Oh! No, I'm in rock, man. I'm in rock and roll, baby. This is umpire related since you work both fastball and baseball. Mm -hmm. Are you a hammer or a point kind of guy? Point. 
There's one way and one way to do it. So all those fastball listeners. Hammer's the dumbest thing on the planet Earth. Considering how long you've been around the ball field, when you're going to the canteen, are you going to burger or are you grabbing a hot dog? Hamburger. Traditional hot dog, man. Put some onions on it and load it right up. Baseball's a hot dog game. Yeah, I, I agree. Baseball's a bit, but after after a ball game, if I'm doing dish, give me a burger. In Swift Current, are you hitting a bird dog? I like the bird dog. That's a Swift Current favorite, a bird dog. If you don't know what I it is, look it up. It's great. What is your favorite Robin Williams movie? Good morning, Vietnam. Good morning, Vietnam. That is by far number one, no question. He had lived two-thirds of it. That is one of the most impressive things in regards to that movie is people don't appreciate that, but every time he got on in front of that microphone, in front of the camera, he just went on a tangent for five and a half minutes. The best thing he's ever done, I I think what he ever did was two and a half hours at, where was that, Uh, Carnegie Hall, two and a half hours, straight talk. You try to do something like that. That's uh, that's amazing. And 90%, I bet you 80% was ad ad lib. Oh, yeah, the man could come right off the tip of his tongue with it. Who's your favorite comedian of all time? Favorite comedian of all time? Oh, God, there's so many. You know who I love the best? John Panette. He was, he's passed now. He was 50 years old when he died. He was a big man, and he did a lot of fat humor, but he was, he, he didn't have to be dirty. Another one I like, Brian Regan. Brian Regan. These guys, I like guys that don't have to use the F-bomb right. to be funny. No, exactly. Just just talk about life. You oh. know, I don't want to know about this, that, and the other thing. I, I like that. And that, oh, Kevin James is another one that I like. Kevin yeah. James. Oh, I love Kevin James and the King of Queens. And it was Jerry Stiller and I think Gary Valentine. But life is funny when you really spell it out. Mm -hmm. Life is funny. Oh, it is. You tell me about your day and you'd realize how many funny things happen. There's no question. Exactly. That's what we do in radio now. It's like you got to watch so closely what you say because you're going to upset somebody on the keyboard. But, you know, if you talk about your life and (laughs) put yourself in it, you're safe. Right. If it happened to you, if you tell a story, you can't get copyrighted. Exactly. And that's what I tell my bosses. I said, you know, I can say what I did. You know, if this happened to me, I'm going to share it. Sharing stories. And that's what we're all about here in the leading edge. One more comedian since we're talking about it. Another one Cheap of my plug. favorite. That's what it's all about in radio. I got no spo- hey, I got no sponsors. No one's paying me to be here. So I got to plug it as much as I can. You're absolutely right. 99.3 The Goat. Now you're just trying to get bonus points from your boss. But what about John Candy? Gone too John soon. John Candy was a god. Yeah. You know, what he did with the Schmangies were my favorite. Yash and Stan Schmangi will always remain the greatest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. You know, and one of the, my favorite movie of his, if you ever get a chance to see Volunteers, okay. it's with Tom Hanks. It's one of the funniest movies. He was hilarious as Tom, T- Tom Tuttle. And I just, after that, you know what I mean? It was just funny. You know, we lost him way too young, man. We lost him way too young. I love John Candy. But the important thing is you lose someone young, you preserve what they have and what they gave because it really makes it important. Amen. Well said. Talks yeah. about living each day to your fullest, but let's live to the next question. Favorite yes. non-baseball sport? Curling. We're recording it during the briar. or what could you expect? Amen. Curling? That's why you get the beep. If it was recorded in August, I'd be going. <laughs> Well, I am the official seventh of the Team Alberta Botcher, the Botcher team. I am the seventh. How are you the seventh? Like, do you plan on getting the call to the bubble sooner? No, I have to stay out of the bubble. That's part of the deal. I have to stay as far away from the bubble as I can so I get chips and I make notes throughout the game. Okay. And I watch their game whenever they're on. I'm actually, basically what it is, I get a sweater. That's all I give a rat's butt about. Uh, is that, but is that I, part I of the restraining order? Stay away yeah, and get the sweater? The, the restra- yeah, part of the restraining order is you stay out of the bubble and <laughs> you get a shirt. <laughs> I, I, Darren Molding, you know, I, I deal a lot with mental health. And uh, Darren Molding and I, we work together on mental health. And uh, he's he's just an incredible gentleman. He's the third for that team. So we've known each other quite a, for quite a while. And I know Mike, Mike McEwen and a few other guys on the team, John Morris and that. Uh, but, uh, no, they've, they've been really good. And that's, <laughs> I'm the seventh. So I sit and watch and eat popcorn. That's your go-to snack. Is it for a curling match? Popcorn? Uh, well, first two ends. Yeah. <laughs> you got a pace. Eh? Makes sense. And then you're hitting the jujubes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. A couple weeks ago, Steve Butang was on. He predicted the Super Bowl champion to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was right. I want your prediction on who will win the Stanley cup. The Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> 
I hear they already have the parade planned. Yes. Like I said, one before I die. I heard that the NHL put a request into the COVID people to say, make sure that pandemic is over because we are going to be having a parade in Toronto. <laughs> yes, pretty much. <laughs> Old John Tory and Doug Ford out there, uh, they're getting ready to lift the restrictions just for the parade. <laughs> From 11 to 11.30 down Young Street. <laughs> Well, you already talked about Alice Cooper, but in your opinion, outside of Alice Cooper, who's one of the biggest celebrities you've ever interviewed on the radio? Garth Brooks. Garth seems to be a favorite here on the leading edge. Yeah, he, he was amazing. We got uh, 15, 20 minutes with him. Uh, what else? And then after that, we every all the media people got to meet him. And he remembered your name and where you were from. And oh, I was wow. in Dauphin, Manitoba at the time. And uh, we got BSing with him. Uh, one of my favorite ones was Adam West. I got an hour with Adam West. The original Batman and Robin, he was the original Batman. And on their show, they would always have a celebrity guest, Ernest Borgnine, I think. What was he? He was the, uh, I think he was the Penguin or something yeah. like that. And, and and all these different people. And Sammy Davis Jr. would show up on the show and all these guys. And he would talk about him. And they were he was so cool talking about all these stars. And he says, yeah, you know, he says, I'm not the greatest actor, but I'm going to my tennis club and then i'm going swimming in my pool so i'm doing okay he said before he died so that was pretty cool that was pretty cool okay let's flip it back to garth brooks because i know garth brooks i gotta ask you then did he play a song for you guys live no, no. what he did is he talked he talked a lot and we just talked about we talked hockey because he knew uh barry trap because you know he was in nashville at the time and we got talking that way he knew not, not just trap but no not trap but uh ernie trotz he knew trotz you know, I got the wrong name, Barry Trotz, because uh, his dad still lives in Dauphin, and I came from Dauphin, and, and blah, 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 and it was, it was really cool. Cool. Get a chance to BS with him in that. I wanted to shake that memory real quick. Can you remember the song you must have played at the end of that interview? You must have played a Garth Brooks song. Uh, Friends in Low Places. Uh, yeah, I don't like that uh, song either. I think no, it's stupid. It's not worth the radio time. Moving on from celebrities, who's your favorite baseball player of all time? Terry Poole. Matches the theme. I don't think there's any explanation required. Tenth and final question. Yes, sir. On the radio, you have the persona Uncle Gus. Yes. Sir. How'd you get the name Uncle Gus? I've been I've been Gus since I was in grade four. Uh, I was always called Costello. That was my nickname because I was like <laughs> that was my nickname. You look more like and, Costanza, but that's okay. Yeah, well, Costanza <laughs> wasn't around back there in the seventies. So anyway, I was looked like Abbott and Costello, so I was Costello. And we, we got kicked out of recess, me and my buddy. Uh, so we went, you know, uh, we had 15 minutes to come up with a name. And I didn't like Gus, so we went alphabetically, and we got to Gus. <laughs> and so Gus stayed with me forever. You know, Gus has been with me forever since I was in grade four. And then the uncle part came with, I did a, I did a spoof on i worked at tsn in winnipeg the radio station yes i did a little gimmick of and oh, i talked about you no know, like this like old ukrainian guy mm -hmm. you know talk like this ukrainian it's called uncle gossing and and i would call into the radio station and i would do my uncle gus hello guys how you was everything like that and i talk you know like people i knew from melville and i would be their you know go-to guy every second day and then some other stations picked up on it, other TSN affiliates. And then I would do something in Toronto. I do something in Edmonton. I do something in Vancouver and stuff like that. And it stayed that way. And then I got to do some emceeing jobs and uh, some uh, stand up. Uh, and it, Uncle Gus just stayed. And I do my videos on on my Facebook page and that kind of stuff. And people like it, which which is surprising. I got about uh, two hundred thousand about on my Ukrainian Christmas one, which is neat. Yeah. And it just picked up from there. Uncle Gus. Yeah, well, and then they said, you know, let's use it on the air. And people here in Castle Gar and surrounding area like it. Working for the radio, what do you mean that you would call in the call-in shows? I'd call in and, they you know, whatever the topic was. And, you know, I, I'd uh, the Jets are playing too terrible i would always bring up you know solani and guys that don't play anymore like bobby hull you know that i don't go to a game i paid 72 dollars to go hockey game and there's no bobby hull it's right, who's this team musalachuk what is that team musalanchuk you know and then i go off on this <sighs> tangent and talk about other things and uh it, it, it's a little bit of vaudeville I, I throw vaudeville jokes in there and people you know it's it, it, it worked out well people loved uncle gus be careful, people. That's what happens when you eat one too many pierogies.
No, it's like, not the cabbage. You had to cut that cabbage. <laughs> oh. Yeah, there's no nutrients or vitamins in the cabbage. <laughs> yeah, I got to stop talking like this. I get caught in the way this I can't get out. Moving on from 10 questions, the next section of the show is what we call local legends. The concept of local legends essentially is somebody who's giving back to your community and umpiring. And maybe let's talk quickly. You mentioned a name, and I would really like the opportunity to discuss Murray Busis. Absolutely. Absolutely. He has done so much to, for umpires and young kids and, and maintaining. The biggest thing he does is maintain uh, these young umpires. You know, go back, you know, 20 years ago and he umpired and that kind of stuff. And these kids could will always remember what Murray has done, you know. And yet I went back to their tournament two years ago and he's still providing and he's still having all these young umpires. Yes. And they and they, they don't say Mr. Buse to say it's Murray, hey Murray, hey Murray. And it's, you know, it's just that respect and that just he's just like one of the guys. But yet, you know, he's done so much. He has done so much and doesn't ask for anything. Murray's been zone four coordinator for a lot of years. And I tell you, when we get the opportunity to meet as a provincial organization here in Saskatchewan, Murray always brings with them a big smile, a giggle. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Uh, nothing but heart, nothing but wanting to see the best for one umpiring, two for the kids or the young people, but three for his community. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, and, you know, Murray is about fourth place in that list. And then comes Murray. Right. You know, you're absolutely <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, he is just an amazing human being. Um, and uh, what he's done, you know, and he gets no credit. You know, he just, even in the city, it's like, uh, it, 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 I really wish, and he's, I wish they would do it, do more because he's done so much for that, uh, for that city, for that area and so much like that. And God bless more people. I wish there'd be more people like him. I tell you, if we had more people like Mary Busis, the world would be a better place because I'll tell you, Murray has definitely had a few sunburns in the back of his neck over the years from leaning over the fence and making sure that he's mentoring these kids, mm -hmm. mentoring these young umpires, and giving them the emotional support that they need so that they can hone their craft and hopefully get to the next level or hopefully just enjoy the opportunity when they mm -hmm. have it. You know, and you see how much he cares. You know, oh. after a game, uh, let's talk about it. He talked. I don't care if there's a 12 year old or if there's an 18 year old or whatever the case is. Yeah. And he and he's willing to do the, you know, the pee wee double. You know, the mm, pee wee exactly. games. And that. no, he's he's not. He doesn't care. You know, he just gives of himself. And and I wish there would like to say we wish there would be more people like that. And God bless him for it. Well, local legend here on this show, people, Murray Busis out of Melville, Saskatchewan. So Murray, mm -hmm. thank you for everything you do. Amen. Well, Trevor, that wraps up this episode of The Leading Edge. I'd like to thank you for coming on and sharing with us some of the great stories and your opportunities in baseball and fastball over the years. Thanks for having me. Hey, now, pleasure's all mine, but there's still one more thing that we have to do before we close out this show, and that's called Wise Words of Wisdom. What I'd like to do is give the guests the opportunity to have the final say on some wise words that they would like to give up on coming umpires. So, Trevor, what are your wise words of wisdom? Have fun. It's just a game, but learn. Have your ears open. You're going to make mistakes. Uh, be prepared for uh, and criticism. Get, you know, learn. The biggest thing is uh, learn from uh, your mentors and everything else like that. But remember, bottom line, it's a game. Have fun. Well, that concludes this episode of The Leading Edge, where we talk with umpires about umpiring and look to cover topics on both sides of the plate. Join us on the next episode where we sit down with an individual that has umpired and supervised at various Baseball Canada National Championships, has worked international events, is currently the president of Baseball Nova Scotia, and a guy that likes to dip his grilled cheese in molasses, Andrew Downs. Now before you go, we would like to leave you with this. There's a common rule myth that people believe that the pitcher must step off the rubber before a pickoff throw. Our question is, what happens if it's a left-handed pitcher. Take care, everybody, and stay safe.